I went in this little, little spot that he was working in a uh, converted home almost. Uh, it may have been, but it was a kind of a little factory, a Spanish looking a factory, cathedral style. And, uh, this fellow was talking into just a horn, just the horn, into the throat of the horn. He says, how do I sound now? And there was a fellow with a raincoat on, and he was standing across the room, and he says, well, it's a little muffled. He says, it doesn't sound as good as when you were over in the center more. And uh, I stood there and looked at him. And I says, you're down about 6 dB right now from you were when you were in the center. And he says, well, how is the high end? And I says, that's way down. I says, well, you don't even, can't even count it. Says, You're way down. So the guy with the raincoat says, you want to take over for me? I got to run. So he ran, and I took over. And I says, well, move over this way a little bit. Move over that way a little bit. And Jim and I were working for about two hours. And finally, he says, let's take a break. You hadn't even introduced yourself? I no, I never met the guy. Never, I don't even know Jim Lansing. Don't know about anything about him. So it was Jim. Jim uh, says, uh, let's go across the street and get something to eat. So we went across the street, and we went to this uh, ranch market. We got a dog, and we got an apple, and we got this, and we got that, and we got talking about this horn. And uh, he said to me, he says, what is your name? And I says, Les Paul. And he says, I'm Jim Lansing. It was just uh, opening a new world for, for me. And uh, in my studio would come people like the Andrews sisters, like Bing Crosby, like W.C. Fields, and uh, Gene Autry, and all the different people that uh, Glenn Miller, uh, Glenn Miller was dead, but his band was alive with Tex Beneke. And they came in my backyard. This is the people from RCA, the people from Capitol, people from Columbia, from DECA, all saying the sound. What is it that makes this sound so great? Well, as I began, unless you have the speakers, no matter how good the sound is in the wire, it's no good until it comes out the speaker. And the final guy is, he's telling you how great it is. And the, the topper of all of it was, is that Bing says, Les, I want that sound at the Kraft Music Hall. I want it at NBC. I said, lots of luck. Now, he's going to, he, and he did. And he got, he just told him, I want my speakers, not RCA, LC1As, out. I want those out, and I want two of them on the stage facing the audience. And when Bing did his show, especially when he went over to, to the Philco show, by that time, he could do what he wished to do. And he had Lansing speakers on the stage. Jim Lansing, back then, in those days, became very, very important to us because he was the only person we could communicate with. This was our man. I worship working with the guy. I couldn't wait to see him because he was always pumped up with enthusiasm. He wanted to get it. He wanted to get it right. Time meant nothing to him. Time, he didn't look at his watch. He just says, you hungry? We go eat and then come back and work and work and work. I'll see you tomorrow. Jim Lansing, with what he did, absolutely made it possible for the musician to get a, a, a very close reproduction of what he wished to hear. Uh, it, without it, without it, we wouldn't have anything out there like today. Jim Lansing, well, he was the, he was the, the king. Jim made it possible so that all of us guys could make it as loud and as true a reproduction today as you're going to get. But he was the pioneer. And then another thing happened one day with uh, uh, Jim and I. And I says, I wonder what would happen, Jim, if God came down and gave you a perfect speaker. I was at Carnegie Hall. 
with Count Basie and everything. Count Basie, those guys would come over and say, goodness, what have you got? I could blow their whole band away with my 604. Do you realize until the electric guitar came in, he couldn't be heard. When he was an acoustical guitar, he was the most anemic person. The stand-up bass was extinct. It was becoming a nothing because no one could hear the bass. You amplified the bass and now it's big. So this is where Jim Lansing was bringing forward to us. Every kid with his rock band out there today has to thank Jim Lansing for it. It was 1949 and uh, I just started to come out of a, a bad automobile accident. And Mary and I were staying at the New Lawrence Hotel in Chicago. We we're going to open at the Blue Note. And uh, I called Ampex and told him that I had received the, the head, the fourth head, which made sound on sound possible. And so we screwed the head on, and we said, one, two, three, four, testing, one, two, three, four, testing. And we played that back. Now we press record and swap the record head. And we did and went to the second head, which is prior to the tape going through the path. And said, hello there, hello there. And we heard one, two, three, four testing. Hello there, hello there, hello there. Well, I threw my crutch across the room and I says, we've arrived. The phone rings and it's Ampex. And they says, Jim Lansing died. And it was at that time that it was very hard to celebrate the birth of Sound on Sound and at the same time go to work knowing that we lost a very wonderful person with Jim Lansing. That was a rough day. <laughs>